the external experts, and the information shared during this broadcast represents the views and opinions of speakers and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of GSK. The product broadcast can, does not constitute an endorsement by GSK of the speakers' views and opinions. So thank you, and it's my pleasure to welcome um, the president of PAT and also one of the speakers of today, Dr. Aluoch. So good evening, everyone. And with that, this third series of our part webinar, a challenge to manage the two diseases in COVID-19 pandemic in uh, Africa. My name is Dr. Joseph Aloy, uh, the coordinator for this meeting and the uh, president of PATS. We've had uh, several uh, meetings on the state of diseases in Africa and uh, COVID-19. Last week we had one on pneumonia and uh, uh, critical care of the respiratory uh, affection. Today is a pleasure to have uh, um, three speakers who are going to further talk on aspects of respiratory diseases in uh, COVID in Africa. Let's start with Professor Gregory N. Abaho, who will talk about managing asthma. And then Dr. Tola Baisa will lead us through challenges in managing pandemic, uh, I mean, managing uh, COPD. And lastly, we'll talk about immunization and child health in Africa, with particular reference to childhood respiratory diseases. And we have Dr. Christy Karanja to take us through. We hope to have some moment at the end of the uh, presentation so that we can discuss a few uh, questions and uh, uh, agendas. I'll just introduce the topic by talking about the burden of respiratory diseases in Africa. Uh, these are the bare facts of respiratory disease in Africa. First of all, respiratory disorders are the number one cause of short-term disability. Secondly, the fourth leading cause of death in Africa 13% of all hospitalizations can be attributed to respiratory affection and decreased quality of life. High health service results and use of uh, resources to manage um, respiratory diseases could be a major economic burden to the society. And we all know that the leading cause of uh, GP consultation is usually due to some form of respiratory disease, either upper or lower. And this results in the largest cause of sick uh, of patients not attending work. Furthermore, it's probably the highest uh, reason why a lot of uh, patients need over the counter medication because of simple respiratory diseases, either cough or some sore throat or some uh, laryngitis. And private uh, public partnership in medical services is essential because these uh, diseases are too many for public deal alone. In Africa, some of the causes of respiratory diseases are multifaceted. One, urbanization with all the pollution is uh, contributing to a lot of uh, respiratory uh, ailments. That is the aging population also. Globalization that is importing a lot of diseases, not to mention the COVID, and the poverty, the poor lifestyle uh, uh, practices, weak health system, and the lack of political will to tackle some of these diseases, but environmental uh, pollution. For the last 30 years, HIV uh, AIDS has contributed immensely to respiratory infections of all types, whether it's TB. Uh, whether it's uh, a typical pneumonia or uh, whether it is ordinary pneumonia. Now COVID has entered uh, the, the, the league. The indoor pollution starts from very early in, in the most places in Africa, in using biomass for cooking, and the babies are exposed by their mothers, this uh, early pollution by biomass, which may in future lead to aspects of a certain disease. This has now been well 
uh, kind of studies in a lot of African countries. And we are now aware that this is a major cause of COPD, even Arsenal. But at the moment, we are in the COVID-19 is basically occasional in differentiating COVID-19 from other usual respiratory diseases. First of all, we don't have the diagnostic capacity for both, whether it's radiologically, biologically, or even clinically. And the drugs are in limited supply, and there's not sufficient critical care capacity. And all types of healthcare workers are in shortage. There's still a lot of stigma, some of the referred diseases, in particular asthma up to now, most of our patients don't like terminology asthma being labeled on them or in their children or their relatives. And now there's another stigma also with uh, COVID-19. And these all affect managing these diseases. So what are the implications of these respiratory diseases in Africa economically? Well, they affect most economically uh, active age. And we know that in Africa, most of the population, nearly one third of the population, if not more, depend on the informal sector for their earnings. And if they are sick, they cannot go to their um, uh, garden to make some food or for themselves or uh, for the sale for the community. And uh, this will result in poverty. And when you have poverty, you become sicker. When you become sick, you become poverty. So it becomes a poverty spiral, which was recognized by the WTW uh, 205 and see this drew them downward spiral and washing disease and poverty. Now, what are some of the obstacles to improve the respiratory disease care? Of course, uh, geographical and uh, near distance with the nearest health unit will be a challenge to some of the people in a very far flung rural area. In the poor roads, in the bridges, as you can see some places in Africa, where it's really like this, all the bridges are, uh, are washed away by the rain, so they cannot reach the nearest health unit. Uh, if they reach quite often, they may not find some of the social drugs. And a lot of diseases in the respiratory system, like asthma, are not given a high rating. Most uh, healthcare workers would probably uh, do, uh, I mean, give more priority to TB or HIV or malaria, which have got more uh, political information. And there's a lot of difference in private and public service in the managing the third disease. So in the end, you have a lot of uh, research diseases occurring frequently. And when they do come, a lot of them come late because of delayed diagnosis. This has a great impact on the economy of the country. And we have increased uh, smoking in our youths in Africa with a lot of environmental pollution, and I said, those waste biomass and limited city sources. Further causes of um, uh, uh, respiratory diseases and some of the traditional hazard industrial and uh, chronic of such primary disease is often associated with post tuberculosis uh, uh, disease, that's heat disease, sometimes uh, of TB, primary TB, sometimes process you can hear consistent with COPD. We show that the predatory acid is also in the large in Africa, particularly with urbanization. And the care in these diseases have a lot of problems. There's very cultural issues. Some patients have different ideas of which uh, method to use for treating what. A lot of population are unable to cope with some of the complex treatments, say of asthma, various inhalers. They may not use, they would use inhalers. Some of them fear inhalers, or if they like them, they have poor technique. And uh, some of them are still embarrassed over this, some of these diseases, stigma. And this causes permanent uh, 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 disability as caused by health, I mean, uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, attitude of some, some of our healthcare workers 
There's a lot of misdiagnosis or other diagnosis of respiratory diseases, lack of training and knowledge among healthcare workers, and a lot of healthcare workers rather manage acute respiratory conditions and forget chronic respiratory diseases like COPD or asthma. And they're willing the time to give education to some of our, uh, of our patients. And for the healthcare workers, a lot of guidelines for a lot of um, a lot of diseases, whether it's asthma or TB or COPD or pneumonia. And the other healthcare workers are not aware of the vision or some of these clinical headlines. So we have a lot of challenges ordinarily with that COVID. Of course, COVID has made it worse, and a lot of these things have been treated by our own self. And that's an introduction, just in case you have been listening, I thank you for doing so. Now, it is really a great pleasure to introduce our second um, speaker tonight, who is going to take us through managing asthma in uh, COVID. Uh, uh, and the pandemic in Africa, the challenge Professor G. E. Ehabo. I welcome you, Olga. I'm happy to. I'm happy to be in this presentation today, and I congratulate the president of PAC for his um, initiative and creativity to make this happen. Now, I am going to be speaking on management asthma in Africa during COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the definition of asthma is well known, and every year the general bodies try to review the definition. But the key thing about the definition is that it is a heterogeneous disease, and the main emphasis is that it's chronic airway inflammation. And between airway inflammation and hyperresponsiveness is a bidirectional thing. Now, the expression of the disease is in wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness and cough, which vary with intensity or as a result of treatment. Now, the prevalence of this disease is increasing. Now, over half a million people are hospitalized because of asthma annually, and over 400 people will die, will die because of asthma every, globally, and it affects over 300 million people. It's assumed that in the year 2025, about 400 million people will be affected. It's one of the most common chronic diseases worldwide. Now, prevalence in Africa is varied, and we need a, a meta-analysis to be able to come up to a, a clear, definable uh, prevalence rate, because when you look at the work studied all over, there are different standards and different, some use symptoms alone, some use uh, symptoms plus long function measurements and so on. But it's clear that asthma is high in certain regions of Africa, like in South Africa, in Kenya, and then it's low in places like Gambia. And then the studies we have about Ghana is also low, but Nigeria comes in between. And so we also know that not only asthma increasing, is a cause of what I call increased presenteeism. People go to work and they are not able to concentrate, or absenteeism, they, go, they don't come to work at all. It's a very cause of disability. And many have found that a disability of asthma can be equated to that of cirrhosis, to that of depression, and even to that of other chronic diseases worldwide. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about the pathogenesis or pathophysiology, 
But the most important thing is that it is the, apart from the TH2 response that induces a lot of bronchial highway reactivity, the most important thing is that it gives you airway, airway inflammation, airway hyperresponsiveness, and airway obstruction. But what we are concerned is that it doesn't lead to airway remodeling. Because once the airway is remodeled and the architecture of the airways is affected, that becomes very difficult to alter. And so in treating asthma, our focus will always be to arrest the inflammatory process after effect, which is airway obstruction. Now let's look at COVID. Now I noticed that in the past presentation for several weeks now, much have been talked about COVID. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time repeating it. But let's see now that over 5 million people have been infected, over 300 deaths around the world. We also know that these features vary from mild, moderate, severe, to very severe and critical, and invariably to death. We also know that those who are predominantly affected are the elderly and those with comorbidities, especially cardiac comorbidities, diabetes, renal disease, liver disease, malignancy, and COPD. And then there is a query about asthma. Now, so many supportive therapies are on, and we are happy that the new drug is performing. Chloroquine has now almost been discontinued in many nations of the world, and the world is gradually expecting the coming of a vaccine. Now, what do we know about asthma and COVID-19? Now, I want to say that there are gaps in our knowledge. One is that no increase in prevalence of asthma due to COVID-19. Almost every studies. And recently, I was in discussion with the American Thoracic Society, in which um, um, Dr. Joe was also involved. And it's almost, and agree, we are almost agree that it's not that it's increasing. But however, asthma may be underrepresented as a comorbidity in COVID-19 patients, uh, fatalities. Now, emerging evidence also show that COVID-19 may not worsen asthma. But the study population of these studies are small. Lighter studies need to be done to evaluate the impact of COVID-19 among patients with asthma. Now, one major thing that is coming clear is that COVID-19 uses um, ACE2, that is um, anguitensin converting enzyme, which is uh, what we call it, which is um, which comes from respiratory epithelium as a means of as a receptor to enter into the cells to this destructive work, and it is found that in asthmatics, ACE2 is reduced, and that could be the, uh, the possibility why in patient with COVID, asthma seems not to be predominant. Again, in vitro models have revealed that inhaled corticosteroids alone or in combination with bronchodilators have been shown to suppress coronavirus replication and cytokine production. Now, these studies are in vitro. Now, the question I want to ask, does in vitro automatically translate to in vivo? This is unclear. And so we need further studies to be able to prove that this is true. Then again, we also know that asthmatics severely affected by COVID are either obese or they have underlying comorbid conditions like GADS, like um, chronic sinusitis, and so on. And we are not, the studies are still ongoing, and we are not sure what the sequelae of patients who have asthma, what, what uh, COVID-19 would do with patients who have asthma. Now, there are a few studies that are around. Well, COVID only started just last year. There were four cases reported in China, no asthma listed. The large studies also that was reported of about a, over 1,000 adults, no asthma listed. Now, in the U.S. studies, COVID hospitalization was shown that 273 of adults between 18 to 49 years of age 
and 13.2 of those between 50 to 64 years, or 12.9% in those 65 years or older have asthma. But let me say this from the U.S. And if you look at these studies, you also know that over 25 million Americans have asthma. So this is not a very good representation. Now, there's a general consensus that the management of asthma in the era of COVID-19 does not change. The same guidelines that was used is still the same guideline, but there are a few modifications. I'm happy that the general always review the guidelines often. Today I was trying to look through the nice guidelines, but I did not see any specific thing that, has, that points to COVID. Now, the first is to make the diagnosis. We all know that diagnosis of asthma is based on symptomatology and also evidence of spirometry, either due to, um, usually due to reversibility, or you you sort, sort of subject them either to physiological challenge like exercise or pharmacological challenge like metacholine. Now, for the symptoms, we know that it is variable that could be episodic. We know that it's virtually nocturnal or early morning. We also know that it's triggered up by exogenous substances. And we also know that the family history of allergies, allergic pharyngitis, allergic conjunctivitis, allergic rhinitis, and eczema will go up. Now, in the era of um, COVID, do we encourage parametry? Now, the general guideline will say no. Why? Because when people blow into either this parametry or blow into the peak flow meter, it could generate a lot of aerosol that could affect not only the one who is administering the exercise, but those around. And so as much as possible, to reduce the risk, we can make the diagnosis symptomatologically, let's do it. And if we have to do the peak, use the peak flow, let it be individualized, used by the patients. I want to say that underpinning the management of asthma is to embrace a personalized and individual asthma management. The days of having the global, um, what do you call it, uh, means of management is, is gone. We must individualize it. And now with the various phenotypes of these diseases, the variabilities of this disease in various patients, we need to look at our patients as one entity and not just to globalize them. Now, central to the management of asthma is the education and partnership. The patients, I believe that a good doctors, one of his major role is education. Somebody says the word doctor came from the word doctoring, which also means to educate. So they must evaluate the risk factors I always tell them, know your risk factors. Although you cannot run away from the world because the risk factors are what you live for. Know the components of the disease. Tell them about the use of medication. Teach Tell them on how to recognize severe attacks and also how to prevent infection in this era of COVID-19. Now, the big issue in management asthma is to do what we call a self-management plan. Now, a self-management plan must be done in such a way that you must be culturally sensitive. Don't just take a self-management plan for any part of the world. It must be comprehensive. And also, it must um, make room for emergencies. It must also teach them about the trigger factors. And also, it must um, prepare them on how they can handle emergencies. Now, Meta-analysis, um, all kinds of um, studies all over the world by BTS have shown that asthma management plan will reduce the severity of attack, will reduce chronicity of the disease, in fact, will reduce morbidity and mortality. Now, for it to be effective, it must be a written action, my action, asthma action plan. It must target the anti-inflammatory nature of the disease, they must, be, they must know about how to step up and how to step down their disease. They must use the traffic light system, uh, system of red, yellow, and green. Red, danger sign, they need to consult their doctor. Yellow in between, and, and green, where their, their drugs are normal and they carry on. 
They must recognize the severity of symptoms and what to do. They must avoid trigger factors and they must know when to seek medical help. Now, in the days of COVID, the eighth point is preparedness. I remember the Boy Scout always say that to be prepared, I mean, and I think all, all of life tells us that to be prepared is to be ready. So in the view of the lockdown and restriction, I advise my patient to have log, large stock of the asthma medications, to have a personal peak flow meter and chart your asthma diary daily. They should have a personalized nebulizer, and I'm going to talk about that later. They should avoid triggers, and they should stay in touch with their physicians. And as much as possible, they should make a detailed study of their own asthma and what to do when things flare. Now, how do we prevent and avoid? Now, I am not sure, and there are no evidence telling us that COVID virus can trigger asthma. But like every other viruses, why not, if not? As a patient must be educated on how to recognize their triggers, indoor triggers and outdoor triggers, endogenous triggers and endogenous triggers. And other things like social distancing, hand washing, face masks, proper hygiene, clean everything you can clean up from your phones, to your doorknob, to your light, to your, to your, um, to your light switches, clean up as much as possible so as to avoid um, infection. Now let's come to face mask. I've been asked this by local journalist that his face mask encouraged for asthmatic. Now there are several materials being used for face mask. Now face mask seems to be the, this is the current industry that's making many people rich overnight. But some of these face masks, some of them may contain irritants that may provoke asthmatic attacks. And some patients may find it, some asthmatic may find it difficult. Some asthmatics also may be claustrophobic and tight-fitted masks will worsen their condition. Also, in those with moderate severe asthma, putting on a face mask in public may, re may result in hypoxia. And then, if, they are, if it is so closely fitted, it may affect them in the air. Now, many nations of the world emphasize face mask. I would say to the asthmatic, use it, but as much as for well, stay indoors, avoid, um, avoid triggers, and if possible, your priorities should be social distancing. Now, the treatment of asthma follows a step care plan, and it shows that you decrease it or decrease it. And that is exactly what asthmatics are, are being managed currently. Now the current thing is assess the patient in which you know the diagnosis, you, you know the control of the patient and the control could be mild, uh, not controlled, partially controlled or severe control. Look for comorbidities in the patient, the inhaler technique, and you make sure you know your patient goal. Then the next thing is to adjust your treatment. And that treatment, you're going to look at modifying factors, comorbidities, pharmacological strategy and education. And we know to, for Africa, we must know, we'll look at the affordability and also the accessibility of the drugs. And we also must look at what is the local um, drug policy of the country you are living in. Then you review. Review involves looking at the symptoms, patients' reservations, and signs of um, side effect. And patient satisfaction is very important. And then long function monitoring. Now, this is the typical step care approach by Gina. And I won't go into details, but one of the major things about this thing is that we are not looking at the smart approach. And the smart approach says clearly that ICS low dose for fomenterol is almost is useful in almost all the stages of, of uh, the steps up to step three. And by the time you're coming to step four and step five, you are dealing with medium dose or high dose. Now, in the previous guideline, you are told to use beta-2 agonists as we required, but now that, that is not obsolete. You are supposed to use low-dose ICS plus formenterol. Now, the slide tells us everything is, is, because of my time schedule, I'll not be able to go into all these step by step. You can see that as you move from, my, from step one to step two, and in step three, you now use a medium, you now use a low dose or medium dose of uh, ICS or a low dose ICS plus leukotrienes. And in step four, 
You smith on those ICS for saliva and the high dose ICS and add on tropion. And then in step four, you now begin to look at phenotypical assessment of the patient. And then you bring in drug uh, tropion, omalizumab, mebolizumab, and all the bio biologics. Now, why is the risk of SABA only treatment very dangerous? And I think I need to say this because of our African situation. Using the beta-2 agonist only, although it relieves you, it leads to beta receptor downregulation. And it decreases bronchial protection. It gives you rebound hyper-responsiveness. It also leads to decreased bronchodilator response and increases allergic response and increases eosinophilic airway inflammation. As you know, eosinophilia is a marker for severity and chronicity. Now, various research has shown that if you use three canisters per year, averaging about 1.7 posts per day, you have a high risk of emerging department presentation. Now, if you use 15 canisters per year, you have higher risks of death. This is found in general guidelines of 2020. Now, the next thing I want to say is we use a personalized special device in low income settings, bottles have been adapted and various special devices. I want to congratulate our pediatricians who are using various innovative to create a special device. And you know the reason why we have special devices is that using the meter dose inhaler alone to give us a, a little amount of aerosol to the lungs. But using a special device, it allows the larger droplets to, to, to settle and the smaller droplets, aerosols, to go into the lungs, which are respirable, and then go straight to the target, which is the lung uh, airways. Now, I want to say again, as I said before, the smart approach is low dose ICS plus fomenterol. It's now the preferred controller option for support and the preferred reliever for all steps. Now, you treat infections. We have seen many kinds of infection, and now, several years ago, when I qualified, we, we only believe that what excites asthma is very excited. We now know bacteria like mycoplasma, you know, even sometimes strep pneumonia will be affected. And so, use of antibiotics is no more controversial. But although viral incentives still remain, look at other pom underlying comorbidities: GAD, obesity, COPD, sinusitis. People used to say asthma and COPD over low uh, over lab. But now people now say asthma and COPD, or asthma with COPD. Now, for emergency, I tell my students simply to use SOS, which means inhaled, short acting, and beta 2 agonist using a volumatic and an oxygen or an, a muscarinic agent, you know, anticholinergic, and an oxygen usually given at about 40 to 60 percent concentration, you know and steroids. And then if the patient is not recovering, you may now need to use other things like magnesium sulfate, helox, and then the patient may now be sent for emergency treatment and so on. I wouldn't go into that details because that's very obvious. Now, let's look at the controversy of nebulizers. What are the advantages of nebulizers? Well, research have found out that nebulizers, many physicians prefer nebulizers because you don't need to and what do you call it? You don't need to educate the patient, it's almost mechanical and so on. And that it's oxygen driven, it has extra advantage in acute condition, it gives large volumes of aerosols, and it does, you don't have to worry about poor coordination between actu uh, actuation and breath, especially for younger and older patients. But there are demerits. And in these days of COVID, COVID, sorry, you don't want to because Nebulizers will release a lot of aerosols that can give, uh, what do you call it, uh, get infection. Also, they are very expensive, and some of them will need to be power driven. And with the frequent blackout in many countries of uh, Africa, that may not be. So, our preferred treatment in this COVID stage is to use beta dose inhaler with a special device. Now, I think my time is up, and I will just quickly summarize by saying that the clear principles of management of asthma is well shown. 
individualized approach, self-care management, pharmacotherapy, please aim at the smart therapy. Look at the underlying inflammatory thing. I don't concentrate on the vocal constriction. Monitor the patient's response using an asthma control test if you can, and ask questions like daytime weakening, and a patient is using more rescue medication or exercise. Give the correct diagnosis and clinical characterization. There are many synonyms, uh, things that mimic asthma, but not so much. Bugate tests, we know about that. Um, patient with chronic sinusitis, patient with um, chronic bronchitis, sometimes even congestive heart failure. But in my own experience, clinical judgment will almost give you a large percentage of it. Let the management be holistic. Don't just manage the asthma, manage the patient. Think about the emotional setup. Think about the environmental challenges. Teach them self-management plan. Let them be empowered to manage their drugs. Even though therapy, well, it's so it's query. We I don't use it, but some countries like the states, some have found it useful. Allergen avoidance, well, it's good if you can. Non-pharmacological treatment are important. Education avoidance and bronchial, uh, bronchial thermoplasty for a few patients. Phenotype you know, specific targeted therapy are those patients who have high eosinophilia uh, who are refractory to normal treatment. And then we can use the IT, IG and anti bucatrin 5, bucatrin 4, and bucatrin 13. The conclusion is there's a need for preparedness in managing asthma patients in this challenging period of COVID. All patients must continue with their normal medications. Health workers must follow strict infection control and control measures. The step care approach remains the cornerstone for the management of asthma. Asthmatics should be taught on self-management plans and action plans in case of acute exacerbation. Current situation is still fleet, and there's the need to continue to monitor the literature so as to bring the current research. <coughs> More studies are needed to confirm the role of COVID-19 in asthma. Thank you so much. Excellent, excellent. Very good and very comprehensive. We thank you very much uh, for that excellent. I'm sure there's a few questions at the end, but we keep them to the end. And I go straight to our second uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Professor Tala Baisa, who is going to take us through managing COPD in this COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. Dr. Tola. Can you hear us, Dr. Tola? Are you there? Hello, can you help? Hello. Can you hear me? It's okay now. It's okay now. Okay. The audible now. Doctor Tola, can you proceed? Can you hear me now? We can hear you, though there is a slight echo. Okay. Okay. Can, now? Follow me. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. For uh, good evening, then everybody. Thank you for your invitation to talk on this timely talk, which is on uh, COPD management 
in the COVID pandemic in Africa. Next slide. The first objectives of this talk will be to understand the burden and the risks of COPD in Africa in general, and understand the challenges of prevailing challenges in diagnosis and managing COPD in Africa, and also understand the COVID and its effects in the COPD effects on COVID outcome in Africa. Next slide. Next slide. Therefore, as introduction, COPD is some a common disease which is, could be prevented, and also it is a progressive life threatening lung disease which is manifested by shortness of breath and maybe by exacerbations and some may go into serious illness. Globally, we have a lot of COPD patients, and the days may go to levels like 3 million days, like in 2015. Is five percent of all deaths. Therefore, the most of the deaths are in low and middle-income countries, and what's important, that's why it is important in developing countries like uh, Africa. And the primary cause of COPD is said to be smoking, but that may be different also in our situation in Africa. Maybe indoor conditions, in the patients and untreated chronic asthma may also contribute to most of the COPD. And it is still a growing uh, burden and problem in Africa, maybe because of a developing and uh, smoking and uh, pollution and also aging may contribute. Next slide. COPD as diagnosis and treatment is already challenging, I have already mentioned that COVID-19 pandemic, a viral infection, mainly affecting also respiratory system, respiratory disease, may worsen an underlying respiratory diseases. Even though it is a systemic disease affecting all the organ system, and they may cause sepsis and RDS, the respiratory system is mainly affected. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is a definition of uh, gold uh, organization defining COPD. We already said it is something common and preventable and treatable, but not curable actually. And it is a persisting symptoms of respiratory system symptoms like shortness of breath, coughing, and the sweat and production as well. These are due to air flow limitation with the narrowing due to airways and also alveolar damage or parenchymal damage, which is also very peculiar to COPD as opposed to asthma, it is due to some noxious and the gases particles also. Because it's an important definition which encompasses the symptom, the risks, and also how uh, that it could be preventable. Next slide. Okay, this is showing part of pathogenesis and the pathology and some clinical presentation. This is also PINA. This is a very summarized uh, diagram. Therefore, patients who are predisposed either by genetic or some factors, if they encounter with excess of smoking or excess of in indoor pollution, they could develop a lung damage. That's mainly inflammatory due to noxious substances by stimulating the neutrophils, metalloprotonal sufficient and tissue damage, extensive tissue damage in this with pathologic effect like emphysema or small airway disorders and abnormalities, and also cytokine effects on the systemic, uh, and on, on our systems also. Therefore, finally, they end with airflow limitations and they manifest with symptoms and also common symptoms and exacerbations and also associated with comorbidities, which are important in uh, COPD management and also understanding because it's associated with many comorbidities. The next slide. Uh, as we see from this uh, graph, epidemiology of COPD is growing from starting from 1998. Therefore, maybe the only disease which did and also 
prevalent sorry, that this show indicates is increasing in COPD as compared with coronary stroke, other cardiovascular diseases, or other diseases are stable or going down, but COPD days is still increasing, maybe disease is still expanding and maybe under diagnosed, under treated, and unprevented. Next slide. Uh, therefore, from the systematic review, which was done actually years back, 2006, and the meta-analysis, prevalent COPD was said to be around 12%, 11.7. This is the from medical meta-analysis findings. And the prevalence was higher in smokers as opposed to smokers, and it's related with age. That's why traditionally the Western is saying COPD is an old man's disease. They were higher in men than women also. This may be different in Africans. We'll see on the next slide. And the COPD is associated with significant economic burden. This is also caused by COPD exacerbation, mainly. Therefore, preventing COPD and avoiding exacerbation is a very important management of COPD. And also, it's a major cause of disability and the mortality. Next, please. Therefore, what is the burden of COPD in Africa? And what is the peculiarity? In Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa especially, COPD is almost unknown disease or poorly stated. The reason is because we don't have adequate structured studies where then because there are a lot of lack of study materials like the definitions were different for COPD. People may also perceive COPD in different forms. Therefore, there is no standardized names or nomenclatures and uh, diagnostic problems. Even based on that also, there are variable prevalences, which range maybe as low as two in some, but four to percent at different studies. These studies were done mostly in South Africa, Malawi, Nigeria, and also some based on their findings. Therefore, there were about 11 cross-sectional studies actually then at different times, and they are showing different uh, prevalences. Next. Uh, therefore, this is a very nice study when compared to other than in uh, Uganda. It is a robust study and also used spirometry. The prevalence is 16 percent, and the speed is showing they used all to the standard study. Therefore, this published on Lancet by Germany. And it showed a peculiar clues also in this uh, in this study. That what we saw is what they saw is prevalence of COPD didn't differ between men and women. And uh, around forty percent of COPDs are certain for years. Surprisingly young populations are COPD. And the most majority, especially women, are never smoked. I think 31% men never smoked. Nearly all individuals with and without COPD have been exposed to biomass. Therefore, biomass might be the most important factor in COPD in Africa. Next slide. Then the diagnosis of COPD. Therefore, the diagnosis of COPD is somewhat difficult that we should be careful when diagnosing it. Therefore, first is, what are the risks of the patient? For example, smoking, that's usually, that's usually clear and known. But in African context, what are the risk factors, especially the indoor pollution and the outdoor pollution? Previously, some, somebody was showing a lady carrying a child and cooking in a, in a non-ventilated or under-ventilated uh, room. That therefore our exposure to children might increase even starting from childhood. Therefore, the indoor pollution is maybe even earlier than smoking, cigarette smoking, which starts later. Therefore, that's important to consider one. And the second is symptoms. And shortness of breath is an important symptom in most of the country in the Western. But in in African study. Shortness of breeze and dyspnea are not common, but coughing and the sputum production 
are the most. Therefore, they neglect actually not considering COPD and the late diagnosis and the complications are common among Africans. And the third and the most important thing is uh, confirming with the spirometric measurement, which is required actually to establish a gold standard device, the gold also. But how many spirometries are there in Africa? That's also another problem and challenge which is better. And currently also with this COVID epidemic, pandemic, could we use the spirometry is another question, risk of spreading the disease, therefore following COPD or diagnosing COPD may be difficult. Next slide, please. Uh, then what's COVID? I don't want to repeat this part because Professor Grigori well uh, explained what COVID-19 is. Therefore, it's a viral disease, which is a pandemic, and originated in China, rapidly spread, highly infective, and the, the productive rate is 2.6 like that. And it is within four four months or three months, 4.6 million cases and 350,000 cases today. In Africa, also 116,000 cases, 3,486 cases on the third day. The case mortality is not high, it is 1 to 3 percent, depending on different studies. But since the number is very high, this could be a serious percentage when we see. Severity and the mortality actually depends on comorbidities present and the control and the treatment of the comorbidities. It also age is the factor that the nexus. Okay, what's COVID in Africa? What are the challenges? And also the comparative advantage to have. So it is clear that, and it's also reported in many other journals, Africa is at risk and because of unregulated urbanization and the high population mobility, large cities, and the limited infrastructure, including hospitals, healthcare facilities, water, and this poor quality of care, weak structure, and high level of respiratory disease already undermined, like asthma, COPD, and also. HIV related, TB, many other opportunity infections are hard. And this high NCD also may increase COVID severity. And also, there will be a decreased external support to our system. Drugs, equipment, and reagents may be under a stringent problem because of the support. Already, Africa is based on external support. Weak public administration, political instability, poor governance, illiteracy, it is all contribute to the challenge of Africa during COVID in, in, in containing this disease and also managing the under of its methods. Uh, there are some few comparative advantages Africa said to be. Demographically, Africa is the uh, youngest population, median age is than 20. Therefore, mostly young people are mildly young. That may be one advantage. Climate issues were raised, but not concluded, but air with uh, temper high temperature and the humid areas are not good for uh, viral from experience flu. That may help also in corona. Time for preparation is there because Africa will be the last to attack the pandemic or corona. Therefore, we may benefit from that. We'll get prepared for that. A lot of experience from the world is learning. Next. How COVID affects the respiratory system? It is important to talk. The respiratory system mainly affected, as already mentioned. There are receptors on that AC2 receptors. Therefore, this, the virus will be tied to these receptors, the invasion of cells and the viral replication in the airways and the down to the alveolar areas, and the pneumocyte tools are affected. Therefore, this, they will also stimulate the immune system activation. Also, syndrome will pass. 
de business, mai de business, cum oamenii Air Business, ai tot cam stormul, mergi organ failure de business, range de COVID, put afectos para o sistema e o sistema, seja o sistema, não é que isso? Mas como você tem o PD afectos de COVID-19? Algumas pesquisas foram feitas em algumas partes do mundo e mostraram que os smokers e os COPD pacientes têm mais receptores de COPD receptores. Isso pode aumentar a severidade de COVID-19 ou pode afetar o câncer. Because that it is suspected that the COPD may have higher, worse outcomes. Underlying and the poor respiratory reserve is there in COPD, therefore, COVID 19 affects the respiratory system. That could again worsen the lung situation. And COVID 19 primarily damage and also it indirectly causes some other injury, cytokine storm systemic. BT, also AKI should occur, and the better affect also the lungs again. And even milder cause cases of COVID-19 could be worse in presence of comorbidities. So, COPD and other comorbidities are also associated. So, the patient with COPD has some other cardiovascular, lung cancer, anxiety, depression, and because that may worsen the condition. And for COPD and the smokers, In research, then, they have increased the risk of complications, higher ICU admission, and higher mortality among COVID. After six people, these are from the meta-analysis and the reviews done by Gabriel and Katami, and also in China recently. Next slide. Then how, how could you manage COVID? COVID-19, therefore the, the management is mainly based on the severity, whether it is mild, severe, critical. That was already mentioned previously, therefore I will not repeat that. It is a supportive care, isolation, home care is important, and also controlling and treating the comorbidities are important. Some antiviral, antimalarials are not yet recommended. In some risk medieval is maybe the problem. Therefore, the main thing in management of COVID is strengthening infection prevention control mechanism, isolation, and supportive care is the most important. And also oxygen supply, finally some mechanical support is very important. And the management of COPD in COVID patients, what's new? Therefore, most of the usual treatment should be done. And the management plan should be planned with the patient. So we should, patients or physicians mm -hmm. or caregivers should monitor their symptoms or exacerbation. These are isolated. So communicate with doctors. Either telemedicine should be encouraged. If talk to the patient, also his chance to communicate. Keep adequate drugs ahead of time. There was also another problem for the resource may be limited. Like to reduce the health institution visit, patients should get adequate drugs in three months. The oxygen supplies should be also availability should be secured for adequate time. And then prevention should be strategy even other return or strengthen to prevent other infection. Because for management, they can continue. Frequently monitoring is important. We think comorbidities is important. And also treat the preventive contribution time. Therefore, oxygen is an important issue in COPD. Therefore, another high flow oxygen is important. But uh, also nebulizers and uh, CPAP or the BiPAP is important, but during this infection, it is a challenge because most of the guidelines are not recommending nebulizers and also CPAP and high flow oxygen are not the direct going machine. That's what's on limited. Regular vaccines should be continued. 
as usual, we have our electric size in the next slide. So for the, in managing the COPD, the usual is we should assess the severity by measuring by spirometry, after orientation, the kind of stage by gold stage. And we assess the symptoms and severity of exacerbations and the precursor. Therefore, we will we'll put into severity risks into ABCD. Therefore, the treatments are based on where the patient the symptoms, in symptomology, in exacerbations, and other comorbidities. Next slide. Therefore, the treatment may be based on the group. If it is a group A or some uh, with few exacerbations and few symptoms, usually bronchodilatory. And then in those group B where uh, symptoms are severe symptoms but no exacerbations, you can give them gamma. And in group C with higher exacerbations and few symptoms, usually on gamma or and in group D, which is all severe exacerbations in the frequent and highly symptomatic, we could give combinations of two or more drugs from LAMA plus LAMA or ICS maybe. Therefore, where ICS is indicated is in this group. Next. Therefore, management of severe but uh, exacerbations maybe in this condition. If it is severe, usually it's obvious, ICU and medical But some mild and moderate exacerbations could be treated. We assess initially severity based on symptoms, also blood gas analysis, and some imaging. And bronchodilators should be increased. Increase the dose and the frequency of short time. And also, parental or systemic corticosteroids should be added. Antibiotics are important during this time. And the then invasive mechanical limitations also could be there. But the risk is aerosolization. Therefore, what's recommended is to use in a single room or a negative area rooms, which is not easily available in our situation also. Therefore, that, that, that's the recommendation. And less very necessary. Using an IV, hydroxygen nebulizers are not required. Time by most of the guidelines and organizations working makers. Therefore, when uh, uh, indication for for medical intensive care patients, severe disease when it's not responding responding intensive care, you may have ICU for uh, reasons of if patient is confused or for reasons of one. Follow them strictly in the invasive medication or hemodialysis. Because these are based on AVG and clinical observations, you may have connectors. Therefore, these are for indications for invasive mechanical medication. Therefore, a careful decision is needed. Because now, nebulizers are not well recommended. Then invasive mechanical ventilators are also not commonly because of the aerosolization. And the mechanical putting or mechanical invasive mechanical ventilator has also its own risk during intervention and also we need capital. Therefore, based on that, even though we have sensory problems, but there are some indications if the patient is not tolerate IV, failed. And also, if the patient has cardiac arrest or uh, massive aspiration, completion, loss of consciousness, severe hemodynamic abnormalities, VT, we may need to mechanically ventilate the patient. Therefore, we have a lot of challenges in COPD management in Africa. Therefore, what uh, actually most of the things are prevailing problems, challenges. But we have also new problems. The underlying prevailing challenges are inadequate diagnosis and treatment. The, the first thing is 
Right? The symptoms are big, like you say, dyspnea, common. They have some big asthma. Therefore, people diagnose have asthma in pericardial COP patients. And also, no spirometry to prove is a fixed obstruction. And uh, no early dyspnea that neglect diagnosed, and it affects also outcome prognosis. And therefore, uh, most of your patients are under-recognized, misdiagnosed by even families, patients, and also healthcare uh, providers. So even we don't know once. Inadequate capacity, the shortage of resource for care is zero. So that's the South African study, 23% of mortality are due to the treatment to COPD. Poor or no healthcare financing, but out of pocket healthcare financing is also another limitation for the people. People are already poor, they don't have adequate money, and they can't work because of the chronic illness, and there is a spiral of poorness. Is all. Next. And therefore, the prevalent low health coverage is there, and also financing. Problem in Africa already mentioned it. Underlying lung damage is a problem when there is a complication with um, this COVID. And attention diversion is also one of the problems in COVID time. So there is a stress on the health system, on healthcare providers, healthcare workers. All attentions are due to our COVID. Therefore, we might neglect the chronic diseases like COPD, and the attention should be given. Should be away by health institutions, should be designed and medicine to help the patients also. The COPD might feel the COVID. The diagnostic challenge was overlapped, diagnosis was Next. In conclusion, therefore, COPD is, uh, has a diagnostic and treatment challenge in Africa. And also complicated. We should maintain the COPD control prevention and also comorbidity, even by the patient. Next, strict control of COVID spread and the need of again. So we should, during patient visit to health institutions, they should be careful to have. COVID infection also. And uh, the nations should be prepared this political commitment. Nations, DC Africa, so collaboration between government, professionals like what we are doing now, educating the health professional, strengthening the health system, maybe using the opportunity. Because now COVID is a, all attention are given to COVID, therefore all the health systems should is the opportunity to improve their health system. Institutions should develop some schemes. The next. And also, finally, we should empower the patient. Patients should even action center, general recommended, should absorb it if they are sick. They should be informed. Actually, not over the phone. They should communicate with healthcare workers, family support, also prevent other patients. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tola. That was excellent, a very detailed account. I'm sure there are a few questions later. So, I think we change years at this moment. First, we go to the small uh, patients, uh, child, children, and then change to a lady. Christine, over to you. The last one, not the least. Thank you very much. Um, I'm the only doctor here, so I will keep my presentation short because I, I am assuming by now people have been saturated with knowledge. 
So my talk today is on the challenges that are facing immunization and child health services in Africa. I will talk about Kenya because uh, having spoken to a few of my African colleagues, I have um, realized that we are more or less um, facing the same challenges. So I will speak about um, Kenya. So I learned today that um, given a poll that was done in um, um, uh, the US regarding how many people would accept to take the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, once it's available, I learned that only 15% would agree to take that vaccine. So we are in the right uh, forum to hear more about immunization because immunization is one of the biggest tools we have to fight uh, infectious disease. So we really need to protect our immunization services. So just um, by way of an outline, because I, um, I can see many of us here may not be necessarily be familiar with the way pediatric services are structured. I will take us through that. A little bit about how it's organized in Kenya. And then I'll talk a little bit about how epidemics can impact immunization services, giving an example of uh, West Africa and the Ebola epidemic of 2014. Then I'll tell us a little bit of how we did to prepare for the continuation of the immunization services and child health services in Kenya during this pandemic, the challenges we've encountered so far, what we have done to mitigate this and what other strategies that uh, we may employ. So it will be quite a short presentation. So uh, looking at that um, slide, which I hope uh, you can all see what I have circled. On the right is how um, pediatric services, child health services are structured. We have the emergency services. We have the newborn services, and we have uh, the child health services, including outpatient services. We have integrated maternal, newborn, and child health, because you cannot really necessarily separate them. The mother and the child should not be separated. It should be taken as a unit. So their care is quite integrated, but I will focus on pediatrics. So that is the book that we use for our immunization and growth monitoring. And you can see it's called the Mother and Child Health Book because we put the mother and child together. So from pregnancy, newborn, and child care, that is a seamless transition. So narrowing down to the child health packages that we have, we have immunization and growth monitoring micronutrient supplementation, specifically the micronutrient that we globally um, supplement is vitamin A. We have um, what I've called IPTI, it's just intermittent preventive treatment for malaria, care of children with HIV, and integrated management of neonatal and childhood illnesses. So that, that is a child health package. Our focus today is on immunization. So immunization uh, services are both under private and public sector. So in the public uh, health system, which uh, will be our main focus, because that's where the majority of Kenyans uh, obtain their immunization services, is in the tier system. That means uh, under tier one, we have community health services. Then we go all the way, primary health care, county referral, and national referral services. So all these in the public sector offer vaccination and minimization. Then we have um, outreach services uh, offering uh, immunization. So where there are campaigns or hard to reach uh, uh, places, there are outreaches that are done. Now in the private uh, healthcare system, this is a non-tier system where we have private uh, hospitals, private clinics, and faith-based organizations being the main providers of immunization in the private uh, 
system. So the, just a snapshot of the vaccines that are offered in the routine immunization schedule. Yes, I will not really go through them. That would be a whole letter on its own, but that is the way they are structured. And children are vaccinated all the way from birth, 18 months. And vitamin A is also administered six months at the age of two years. So coming now to our subject for today, we drew our guidance on how to continue with immunization from the lessons that were learned during the Ebola outbreak of 2014 in West Africa. So we, when we had that um, the first case of um, in March, the first case of COVID-19 was announced in Kenya, we straight away went to work, the Kenya Pediatric Association, together with the Ministry of Health and uh, Child Health Services, we came together and um, came up with strategies to mitigate the effects. So from the lessons that uh, we learned, uh, drawing from this uh, paper, we want to look at the impact of the Ebola outbreak in three countries. The main three countries that had most of the cases were Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And this was the largest epidemic ever documented, which resulted in 11,000 deaths. So what happened during this time? The weak health systems were overwhelmed. It only takes a large epidemic or a pandemic to, un to, cover, to un uncover the weaknesses. That so many health facilities were closed. Others operated at lower capacity. So what is responsible for this failure of the health system? One, there was already a shortage of staff and many of them were deployed to cope with the epidemic. There was also disruption of medical supplies, and then the health services utilization, health user uh, utilization declined because people feared contracting Ebola at the, at the facility. So people stayed with their diseases home, people kept their children home, not vaccinating, and all the health resources were shifted towards the Ebola response. And unfortunately, which has not uh, really been the case here, there was death of healthcare workers. So that served even to compound the already huge problem. So we know that these countries that I've mentioned already had uh, ongoing civil conflict, fragile health systems. So this, of course, uh, severely affected the immunization program. Because um, unfortunately, immunization programs are never really viewed as essential services because we are dealing with well children. So both um, the health systems and even the caregivers themselves perceive immunization as not really an urgent need. So the services that were disrupted were the routine immunization services offered at facilities the scheduled campaigns for polio and measles rubella, introductions of new vaccines were withheld, supervisory visits by the immunization team were not done, program reviews were not done. So in short, the immunization program literally collapsed. So what happened? Of course, whenever you disrupt the immunization uh, program, you will always have a resurgence of vaccine-preventable diseases. And the first one is um, usually measles. Why measles? Because we know that measles is, if not the most highly contagious and infectious disease known, it is quite infectious. And it has really been recognized as the first vaccine-preventable disease to emerge once a vaccine program has been disrupted. So this is one disease that we look at whenever we have uh, disasters or events that curtail immunization services. So you can see, of course, the slide is not very clear, but I'm sure that um, you, are, you are able to visualize the spikes in 2015, 
2016 and 2017 of a measles resurgence in those three countries. So moving on. Um, the WHO stepped in and provided some guidance on how immunization services were to be carried out during the Ebola outbreak. So the main guidance was that vaccination should be protected and intensified. And if necessary, vaccination campaigns were to be done. So they put measures, which um, we uh, have also borrowed from, to create um, protected areas for immunization services to be carried out. So there was the issue of crowd control, which we now call social distancing, triaging, infection prevention and control measures, and then observing safe injection and waste disposal practices. So that is the guidance that was made by the WHO. So we borrowed uh, from that, and now I want to talk about the Kenyan response. So what have we done this far? So we developed guidelines. So that is one of the guidelines, the Kenya Pediatric Association, together with um, some key partners that we work with, and the Ministry of Health, we came up with guidelines to guide facilities in how to continue caring for children, how to continue rolling out services in various sectors. And in this guidance, it was just a small guidance. Didn't give a much detail, but it gave uh, facilities, ways and, um, and, and strategies of how to carry out various um, services. So we covered five areas, isolation facilities for children, triaging of children with the respiratory tract in OPDs, newborn units, routine um, routine uh, for chronic care clinics, and then now routine immunization services, which will be our focus for the remaining few minutes or so. So the routine immunization services, we gave a few recommendations. We gave about seven recommendations. And overarching all was that the immunization was to continue, but we were to advise uh, clients to continue using the smaller facilities to avoid crowding in the big facilities. However, we advise that even the big facilities should create outposts, outreach posts, so that you can have the children being vaccinated away from the rest of the people. As much as possible, and especially in the private sector, mothers are to be given specific scheduled appointments so that they also feel safe and they also uh, limit the crowding. Then uh, the infants and caregivers were also to be subjected to the routine screening that everybody coming to the hospital was being subjected to so that those who have possible exposure can be directed appropriately to a point of care to avoid um, infecting others. Now, the other thing that we recommended was that community health workers would also be deployed to mobilize mothers to continue seeking immunization services. Remember, community health strategy forms tier one of the health systems in Kenya. So community health workers remain very key to deploying health services in the community. So we also anticipated given the lessons we learned from the Ebola outbreak, that we would need to have possible catch-up immunization activities. And this is to be planned for, even as the outbreak is ongoing. And continuously, we should continue to reassure the community that immunization is ongoing, so that they should not shy away from seeking immunization services in their facilities. The other guidance that we uh, developed was for the community health workers to use in this uh, time of the COVID-19. So we developed um, guidelines for COVID-19 to for use within the integrated community case management program, which has been ongoing. 
and we outlined some tasks, we outlined some protocols for them to follow, but I want you to note number four, which relates to immunization. Their main task of the community health workers is to provide information that services are ongoing, to continue reassuring uh, the caregivers that routine immunization is ongoing. Because if uh, the, 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 the parents feel that every hospital has been converted to COVID-19 care, they will not seek. And if they feel that they are unsafe, their babies are not safe, they will not bring them to the clinic. But what is the situation on the ground? Having done all that, we do not have consolidated data yet, but we do know that both private and public clinics, immunization clinics, have recorded a significant reduction in attendance. So what is happening? Where are these people going? Um, in the next slide, we have that picture there. It shows uh, very many mothers, and some are not even mothers because they're not holding babies. They have chosen to turn up in outreach services. So that is where they're getting their vaccination. This is a low income setting in one of the low income capital. And you can see there that uh, the mothers have brought their babies and including some whose babies turned out to have fever. So that is where people are feeling safe. And what is the reason for this? The main reasons that are cited for this low attendance. One, and this I got even from my colleagues um, in the other African countries, my pediatric colleagues, pediatrician colleagues, their fear of contracting COVID-19 disease from the health facility. Remember at the beginning of the pandemic, we were passing the message, keep away from hospital, keep away from hospital, you will overwhelm the, 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 the services. So people, that message stuck. So even the ones who need to bring their children for vaccination have chosen to keep away. Then there is the issue of being tested. At the moment in Kenya, if you're tested and found positive, we do not yet have home-based care. So regardless of whether you are asymptomatic, we have to um, have these people taken to an isolation facility. And if all their contacts have to be sent to a designated quarantine. So that thought has kept many people away. Some even feel that the thermogun that is at the screening areas, that the one for testing temperature is a form of COVID-19 testing and uh, immediately it's uh, tested on you, you can be sent to quarantine. So that has made people keep away. Again, like I had mentioned before, immunization is not perceived by many as being a critical service. So even to caregivers, it is deemed a non-urgent service that can be deferred. Uh, my Ugandan colleague told me that in Uganda, because of the, the, the curfew and the limitation, the lockdown preventing movement, if you want to go to seek an urgent to a non-urgent hospital visit, you have to get a permit from the district office. And there is usually a long queue. So many people have are busy and they, they would rather not do that. Now, uh, health worker is reluctant to handle children with fever due to inadequate uh, protective gear is another reason. Again, addition of one extra screening and triage step has just lengthened the process of receiving care in hospital. And that, and that is perceived as being inconvenient. Um, so the vaccination program has developed a survey tool to collect data with a view to responding to these challenges. Yeah. So there's a tool that has been sent to county facility leaders so that they can collect data to inform the next steps so that we will be able to know how to continue to mitigate. So should we be worried? Indeed, we should. Look at this uh, graph showing what happens 
whenever there is a disruption of immunization services. I have circled 2017. This is the immunization coverage data from 2005 to 2018. In 2017, there was a Kenya health worker strike, and you can see the immunization coverage went down. It went to, almo to almost, um, actually it went to below 50%, whereas normally most, um, most of the counties report good coverage of 80%. So that was very worrying. So what happened next? What happened is that in 2018, you can see there, I've marked the arrows, we had peaks of measles. I told you measles is one of the first things to uh, come up when, whenever you disrupt an immunization program. So that may happen with us. So what will be the way forward? Move, going forward, what should we do? Our key strategy, in addition, to strengthening the immunization programs that are ongoing is to harness advocacy. So we will mobilize our local politicians, religious and community leaders, churches are closed, but I guess this is one of the ways we can engage. Community groups, health educators and mobilizers, the media shall be our friends, and private sector and NGOs, we shall all rally together for this worthy cause. So with that, uh, my friends, I come to the end of my presentation and uh, thank you all for listening in. Excellent, Chris, very well uh, put. Um, Josephine, how are we doing for time? Not rather badly. Oh, not badly. We are at 7.30 mm -hmm. um, and I can see the question and answer box has uh, five questions. And okay. including one in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So, so what is suggesting? Do we answer some we questions? We can answer the questions. Yes. Yes. I think okay. we can. Answer All right. Questions. Okay. Let's try to start with one to uh, Dr. Anna Holm. What is your recommendation for healthcare workers who are asthmatic and need to use N95 mask? Yeah, thank you so much. The, thank you so much for the presentation so far. The truth about it is that we have this rule in medicine that your health, you know, is number one, is first. I mean, just like the airline, put up your, put in your face marks or your oxygen marks before you put somebody else. If they are, find it uncomfortable, with the mask, it makes them difficult to breathe. I would advise them to try the shield. And if the shield can as well do the job, they should go for it. Okay, while you are on the, on the micro, what is your thought on the use of magnesium salvage in severe refractory asthma? Um, well, magnesium sulfate, I've not, we don't use it commonly in our practice, but I think in the pilotic case group they use it. We have not had a um, question of refractory asthma like that because magnesium sulfate is used in the acute setting, our own setting, when the patient has not responded to the first initial management. But I'm sure it's used by the pediatrician, and I think it's good. Yeah. Well, it can work when FBS has failed, and it's been used, but very rarely. And um, so if you have nothing else to do, well, use it. Just like what we're doing in COVID now, we don't have anything else. So we're using everything and every and nothing else. Is there a combination of formula for IES, ICS formula in Kenya? The answer is yes. Um, regarding um, what is your experience in availability of serial continuing maintenance in Holland in your native country and across Africa? Dr. Anahal. Hello. Um, I can repeat the question again, please. What is the availability of ICS inhalers therapy in your native country and across African subregion at large? 
Well, um, inhaler um, are available, but usually nowadays they are available in combination therapies, either on um, in, in various combinations by either GSK, AstraZeneca, or some other companies. But previously, we used to have inhaler canister and also um, what we call it, beta 2 um, canister separately. But research, clear research have shown that when you have the two of them separate, the ICS and SABA, it, and you, um, I mean, you, it's only good for just mild persistent asthma, and it's not useful for any asthma beyond the mild persistent asthma. But for to have a, a better control of your asthma, you have to use ICS and a long-acting bronchodilator um, therapy. And that reduces severe exacerbation, it enhances compliance, it reduces the need for rescue maintenance medication, and then it reduces the overall lower use of systemic steroids. So I think the, 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 the shift of knowledge or the shift of practice is to discourage using these two, the individual canister of ICS and SABA. That used to be the practice, but that seems to be changing now. Knowledge is shifting out from that. Thank you. Um, Josephine, I don't think, um, Michelle, do you have anything else in your box? So there's one that has come, I think probably right now, um, about um, have you noted obstructive lung disease as a consequence of TB, and how do you treat such patients in your practice? Yes. Uh, for the last 20 years or so, uh, we have recognized in Africa that there is the so-called post-PTB, COPD, and that the section left behind in the lungs by the TB infection often uh, leads to all features of obstructive uh, airway disease, and the treatment is more the same depending on the clinical presentation. So yes, I have noticed, and it's probably as common as any other cause of uh, um, COPD in Africa, but I'll ask Dr. Toller to comment on it. Are you there? Is he around? Yeah. Can I comment on this too? Okay. Go ahead. Can I comment on this? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, the bold study, which is uh, pioneered by the Imperial College, led by Peter Boni, the first bold one study showed that, especially in South Africa, that the highest number of COPD patients came from patients who had tuberculosis. We also pioneered a bold study in combination with Imperial College. We are now in the bold two and gradually moving to bold three studies. And we found out that tuberculosis is high, well, not high comparatively for patients who have COPD. And usually when a patient has COPD, um, treatment is no more, you're not directing treatment on the COPD itself, as you're directing the treatment in the components of the disease and trying to reduce exacerbation and also managing comorbidities. So, as I can say, it is the same kind of treatment, but that has to depend on the level of severity. That also has to do with whether the patient has comorbidities and then that has to do with the setting with the patients the diseases come. And now, currently, people are now using pulmonary rehabilitation, and that they are also trying to vaccinate these patients and see if they can use lung reduction, um, what do you call it, approach for patients that have clear emphysema. Dr. Alot, I think you're still on mute. Oh, that's me. Okay, I was on mute, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Christine, 
Can you try this one? Are you there? Christian? It's not there. Okay. Gregory, can you answer this? Is, there, is the same advice used for sub applicants with periodic patients, especially under five years old? Sorry. We don't encourage SABA for treatment of asthma as a single therapy again, because it's not only that it is very dangerous, long term effect can also lead to airway remodeling, which may further worsen the asthma. I think at every age group, at any level of asthma, using SABA alone is not encouraged. We always say that even at the mildest state of asthma, there's, under, there are, there's a lot of airway inflammation and there's a lot of airway changes. And early work done by people like Peter Barnes in um, Brompton showed that even in the mildest asthma, you have airway inflammation. And then if you start giving them SABA, you're going to increase hyperresponsiveness. You're going to lead to what do you call it, um, down regulation and then um, other effects, so it's not encouraged. We don't encourage it again. It's obsolete. Thank you. Um, just, I think we are so far we're done well. Yes, yes, we have. Uh, yes, we have. Okay. Um, so it just remains for me to thank all the presenters. Um, Christopher, uh, I see you are listening there. Christine, thank you so much. Gregory, thank you very much. And uh, Tolas, thank you very much. Enoch, thank you for your participation. And Josephine, thank you very much for your assistance. And Gobele, thank you very much for guiding us. Are you still there, Gobele? <laughs> and um, all the participants that have been with us and the CD 376 have been still hanging on. We thank you very much for uh, coping with us. And I'd like to thank uh, GSK for continued cooperation and having given us three good sessions um, talking about uh, respiratory diseases and COVID-19. Thank you very much, GSK. We hope we continue the same thing in the future. For me and from parts, it's for me to say bye-bye. Thank you, sir, dear. Good night, wherever you are. Over to you, Josephine. Um, thank you. You've said it all, Dr. Alwot. Um, thank you, Pat, for the opportunity to collaborate. Thank you, the speakers and panelists, for the discussions and the very elaborate uh, presentations. And thank you to all the participants who are able to join in and log in. Um, hope to see you soon again. And have a good evening and good night. Thank you. And keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.